Hey everyone, Nigel and Luke here, and welcome to Crime Zone. On the night of July 25th, 2018, friends and co-workers of Andrea de Gelder were feeling uneasy. The 39-year-old mother had failed to show up for her usual overnight shift at the Charlie Norwood VA Medical Center in Augusta, Georgia, where she worked as a medical technologist. Like most nights, Andrea had been scheduled to work the graveyard shift from 11 p.m. to 7 a.m. the following morning. However, on this particular night, she had been a complete no-show. This was extremely out of character for Andrea, who was normally a punctual person and also very reliable. She wasn't the kind of person to simply blow off work. In fact, the last time that anyone had seen her was earlier that day, when she finished up another shift at the medical center that she had covered as a favor to one of her co-workers. When she left just after 7 a.m., she hadn't said anything to suggest that she intended on missing work that night. All of this is to say that when hours began to pass without so much as a phone call from Andrea, it started to put those that knew her on edge. So much so that when repeated calls to her cell phone went unanswered, they ended up phoning one of her friends to see if they knew what was going on. The friend didn't know what was happening either, but also tried calling Andrea several times to see if they could get a hold of her. When that failed, they went over to Andrea's house, hoping to find more information. When Andrea's friend arrived at her house, located roughly 20 miles west of Augusta in the city of Grovetown, nothing of interest immediately stood out. The small, single-story property sat unassumingly amongst its neighbors in the subdivision of Ivy Falls a quiet suburban neighborhood set a good distance away from any major roads. The front door was locked, and nothing seemed to be amiss on the exterior of the property. However, when Andrea's friend knocked at her door, they received no answer. Now quite concerned, and left with seemingly no other options, the friend called the Columbia County Sheriff's Office and asked if they could conduct a welfare check. By the time the call to police was made and officers arrived at the scene, it had been well over 12 hours since Andrea had failed to show up for work, and roughly a full day since anyone had heard from her. When police finally entered Andrea's house, they could not find her and quickly determined that she was not inside. However, what they did find was a number of disturbing clues, ones that suggested that wherever Andrea was, she had been taken there against her will. This is the story of Andrea de Gelder. Before we get to the main part of today's story, if you find our videos interesting and informative, don't forget to like and subscribe to Crime Zone for more true crime content like this. It really helps us to continue building the channel, and if you've watched a few of our videos already, you might not even realize that you're not subscribed. While you're there, don't forget to hit the notification bell as well in order to stay up to date with our latest releases. Okay. With that out of the way, back to the video. Andrea de Gelder was born Andrea Pauline de Garmo in March of 1979 in Peoria, Illinois. Not much has been reported about her childhood, but we know that her parents divorced when she was relatively young, and that she grew up in Salisbury, Missouri, with her mother and two siblings, Amy and Logan. After graduating high school in 1997, Andrea headed off to college, eventually meeting a man named Ryan de Gelder in the year 2000. Ryan was in the U.S. Navy, and when he and Andrea were married two years later, Andrea quickly adjusted to life as a military wife. Shortly after their wedding, the couple moved out to San Diego, California, when Ryan got stationed there. This was just the first of many moves that the couple would make over the next few years, as Ryan was continually relocated across the U.S. for work. Throughout all of it, though, Andrea proved that she was more than up to the challenges that this posed both personally and professionally, as she managed to find steady employment virtually everywhere they went. Based on the information we were able to find on her LinkedIn profile, it appears that most of these jobs were on the research side of the nursing field, where she worked as either a clinical research associate or coordinator, helping to conduct clinical trials. By all accounts, during these years, Andrea and Ryan were successful and happy. However, at the tail end of 2010, Andrea's life would take a drastic turn when she received some startling news about her health. It all started on Christmas Eve of that year, 
when Andrea and Ryan went snorkeling at Shark's Cove on the Hawaiian island of Oahu. Ryan was stationed in Honolulu at the time, so that day he and Andrea had gone out for a bit of holiday fun and excitement. Unfortunately, when the couple returned to where they had parked their vehicle, it was nowhere to be found. It had been stolen. The theft was especially devastating because of how many of Andrea and Ryan's personal items had been in their vehicle at the time. In addition to their phones, wallets, and Andrea's purse, the thieves had made off with their camera, camcorder, their house keys, and even Andrea's Christmas bonus. Three days later, Andrea and Ryan traveled to a local mall to get replacement phones when their string of bad luck continued. They were rear-ended while driving in their other car. Though the accident was minor, Andrea and Ryan still went to the hospital because Andrea was 25 weeks pregnant at the time and they wanted to make sure that everything was okay with the baby. While they were there, a doctor told them that there was something abnormal with Andrea's blood work and that tests would have to be run again. A few days later, she was diagnosed with aplastic anemia. For those unfamiliar, aplastic anemia is a rare and serious blood disorder that occurs when a person's body stops producing enough new blood cells. It's essentially a form of bone marrow failure, which leaves the body susceptible to infections and uncontrolled bleeding. The condition can be mild to severe and even fatal, and as Andrea would soon find out, she was much closer to the severe end of the spectrum. Over the next few months, her health continued to deteriorate, though thankfully, in March of 2011, she gave birth to a healthy baby boy that she and Ryan would name Kellen. Unfortunately, though aplastic anemia can reportedly manifest during pregnancy, Andrea's condition didn't improve after her son was born. This meant that she would need a bone marrow transplant. Luckily, Andrea didn't have to look far for a donor. Her brother Logan was a match. However, Andrea would still have to undergo a series of highly unpleasant treatments, including radiation and chemotherapy, before the surgery could take place. A few months later, she was further diagnosed with an even more rare and serious condition, a type of cancer called myelodysplastic syndrome. This meant even more radiation and chemotherapy, and left Andrea with a five-year survival rate of just 50 to 60 percent. By this point, she had moved back to Missouri to be closer to family, but this meant being separated from her husband who needed to remain back in Hawaii where he was stationed. Andrea's contact with her newborn son also had to be limited because of her extremely fragile immune system. She was essentially living her life in quarantine. To help herself cope with everything that was happening, Andrea started a blog that chronicled her journey called Surviving Aplastic Anemia. It was here that she would share her struggles, her milestones, and her fears as she continued to undergo a variety of treatments. Amidst all of the terrible things that were happening to her though, Andrea maintained a steely resolve and began to plan for life beyond her illness. She started studying for her graduate record examinations with the goal of continuing her education and applying to graduate school. In July of 2011, Andrea received her bone marrow transplant. The surgery went well, and though the next few months continued to be filled with painful treatments and side effects, by the beginning of 2012, it was clear that she was rounding a corner. The transplant had worked. By the end of March that year, Andrea had essentially made as close to a full recovery as possible, and she was able to reunite with her husband and son. Though she stopped contributing to her blog at this point, the passion that the illness had inspired in her never went away, and she continued to pursue her academic studies. For about a year, she, Ryan, and their son moved to the Washington, D.C. area before settling down in Grovetown, Georgia where Andrea obtained her master's degree in clinical laboratory science at Georgia Regents University. According to reports we came across in our research, she even won the school's Excellence in Research Award for Allied Health in 2017. Sadly, despite Andrea's amazing academic achievements and winning the battle against her life-changing illness, it wasn't the end of her challenges. In 2017, after 15 years of marriage, her husband Ryan filed for divorce. Now single again for the first time in her adult life, Andrea decided to keep living in Grovetown, eventually moving into a quiet suburban subdivision called Ivy Falls, where she would buy a house. 
It was a quaint, one-story brick property with a single-car garage and small fenced-in backyard area. More than enough room for Andrea and her son, Kellen, who took turns living with her and her ex-husband. For the next year or so, Andrea's life was by all accounts uneventful. Because she took a job working mostly night shifts at the Charlie Norwood VA Medical Center, neighbors rarely saw Andrea unless Kellen was being picked up or dropped off by his father, or if Andrea was coming or going from work. She was quiet and mostly kept to herself, seemingly the last person that anyone would have had any kind of problem with. However, all of that would change on July 26, 2018. As previously mentioned, the first sign that something might be going on with Andrea was when she failed to show up for her overnight shift on July 25th. This was strange, not only because she had been at work that morning and hadn't mentioned anything out of the ordinary happening, but because, as investigators would later learn, she had also spoken with friends just a few hours before she was supposed to be at work that night, and sounded completely normal. She was supposed to meet friends for dinner before work, but those plans had been cancelled, leaving Andrea with a few spare hours to herself before she had to be at the medical center. These friends would actually be the last people that Andrea communicated with before anyone realized that she was missing, with the last contact reportedly happening at around 4.15 p.m. By the time police went to conduct the welfare check at Andrea's house, it was almost a full 24 hours after this last communication. When officers entered Andrea's home on the 26th of July, no one was sure what they would be walking into. Based on the health issues she'd experienced in the past, it's safe to say that at least a few people were worried that there had been some sort of complication that had made her unable to call for help, or that she'd experienced some sort of accident. However, what police discovered inside Andrea's home was far more alarming than anything her friends or family could have imagined. Though the doors and windows to Andrea's home were all locked and there was no sign of forced entry anywhere, it was clear to police that there had been some sort of a struggle inside. Multiple rooms in the home were disheveled, and the contents of Andrea's purse were found scattered on the kitchen floor. The most disturbing clue of all, though, was the blood evidence. Blood was found on the walls and floor of the kitchen, and another trail of it was found leading down the hall towards Andrea's bedroom. Inside, there were a number of clothing items that also had blood on them, which had been left on the floor and on the bed. Still, there was no actual sign of Andrea anywhere. She wasn't in the house, but her car had been left in the garage, which was also locked. Perhaps the best clue aside from the blood evidence the police were able to find at the house was Andrea's cell phone, a pink iPhone 7 which had been left in the living room. The phone had dozens of notifications for missed calls, messages, and emails from her worried friends and family members, and almost immediately, investigators obtained a warrant to gain access to the rest of the phone's contents and records. While news of Andrea's disappearance began to travel immediately, the official details of her case weren't reported to the public until the following day. At this point, representatives from the local Columbia County Sheriff's Office announced that they were confident that Andrea had not simply disappeared, but that she had been taken against her will. They also said that based on the evidence found at the scene, mainly the lack of forced entry, they were almost certain that whoever was responsible for Andrea's disappearance was someone that she knew. As a result of this conclusion, police spent much of the initial hours of their investigation reaching out to people that knew Andrea so that they could interview them, including her friends, family, co-workers, and neighbors. Boxes of evidence were hauled out from the house and taken away for examination, and detectives also began collecting footage from anyone in the neighborhood they could find who had home surveillance cameras. Needless to say, News about the chilling circumstances of Andrea's disappearance sent shockwaves through the local community. Being just a small city, incidents like this were extremely rare in Grovetown, especially in the more isolated suburban neighborhoods like Ivy Falls. In fact, according to sources we came across in our research, as recently as 2020, Grovetown was ranked as one of the safest cities in Georgia by real estate data site Home Snacks. Residents grew even more uneasy when local media began to report that prior to her disappearance, Andrea DeGelder was active on a number of dating apps and websites. 
This was particularly alarming because just a few weeks prior, news had spread about another Ivy Falls woman who had a terrifying experience with a man that she met on the dating app, Bumble. After the two went on a couple of dates, the man began to behave oddly, and the woman was so concerned that she had gotten a protective order against him. The man had been arrested for stalking her just a few days before Andrea went missing. It would come to light in further media reports that this man could not have been connected to Andrea's case because he was still in jail at the time of her disappearance. But all the same, the story put people on edge and shattered many residents' image of the neighborhood as a safe place. In the meantime, Andrea's friends and family hung up missing persons flyers in the surrounding area, and on July 30th, a letter written by her mother was published pleading for her safe return. On August 1st, almost a week after Andrea had gone missing, the Columbia County Sheriff's Office scheduled a press conference where they would deliver the details that everyone had been dreading. A body had been found, and authorities were fairly certain it was Andrea de Gelder's. Though police would never officially release how they came across the body, as far as we can tell, the remains were discovered in a dumpster behind a Walmart and a Dollar Tree store at the Gateway Shopping Center just off of Interstate 20. The remains were found partially clothed and had been bound with duct tape. While there were apparently no cameras in the area that were able to show who had dumped the body, investigators stated that they were confident that they had all that they needed to solve the case. They said that DNA evidence had been collected from Andrea's home and that this, along with the remains, had been sent to a Georgia Bureau of Investigation crime lab for analysis. In fact, police were so certain about their ability to find the person responsible for the horrible crime that when asked about their timeline for solving the case, one of the representatives from the sheriff's office replied, quote, We don't think it's a matter of if, it's a matter of when. The day after the press conference, Investigators released more heartbreaking news, stating that they had confirmed that the body they had recovered from the Gateway Shopping Center belonged to Andrea de Gelder. She had been identified via fingerprints. After conducting an autopsy, the coroner concluded that Andrea had died from strangulation, and that due to the level of decomposition, her body could have been where it was found for nearly a week. This meant that she might even have been killed on July 25th, the same night that she failed to show up for work. However, it was difficult to say this for sure since there were no security cameras at the shopping center covering the area where Andrea was found. As a side note here, one of the things that we weren't able to find adequately discussed when we did our research was how police were able to square Andrea's cause of death with the blood evidence they discovered at her house. It's possible the explanation is as simple as that there was a violent struggle there before she was strangled, either in her house or somewhere else. But as far as we can tell, police never specifically said this. Perhaps there's a reason that they never shared this information with the public, or maybe we're just making too much of this fact, but we wanted to point it out in case any of you were also wondering. With the news that Andrea's case had officially moved from a missing persons investigation to a murder investigation, the fear and anxiety in the community began to give way to sadness and anger. Justice for Andrea signs were posted all over the surrounding area, and a candlelight vigil was held in her honor on August 3rd. A couple of weeks later, Andrea's body was returned to her hometown of Salisbury, Missouri, where she was officially laid to rest. On August 21st, just three days after Andrea's funeral, local residents and the media began to get word that investigators had made their first major break in the case. Though no official statement was made until at least a day later, that evening, police were photographed at another house in Andrea's neighborhood taking boxes of evidence out. The house belonged to a 55-year-old man named Christopher Gibson. While reports seemed to contradict each other about the precise location of Gibson's house within the neighborhood, with some saying that he lived right next to Andrea and others saying that he merely lived in Ivy Falls, we know that Gibson was one of her neighbors. We also know that he had a long criminal history. As early as 1983, Gibson had been arrested and convicted on numerous charges in Georgia and South Carolina for offenses ranging from misdemeanor theft to burglary and obstruction of an officer. At the time, he had also recently been arrested on a felony shoplifting charge, and was under investigation for harassing and making vulgar comments to an 18-year-old woman. 
This woman also happened to live in the Ivy Falls subdivision. When police searched Gibson's home, they recovered some drugs as well as a handgun, which he was prohibited from owning. He was charged with possession of a firearm by a convicted felon, and soon after, investigators announced that he was a person of interest in the Andrea de Gelder case. While police would release few details about what they had linking Gibson to the case, they did say that the surveillance footage that had been collected from neighborhood residents had played a role. Unfortunately, it appears that specifics about the footage were never released. However, one article we came across mentioned that investigators never observed anyone going in or out through Andrea's front door. That same report stated that police believed Andrea had been taken to the place where her body was dumped in her own vehicle, possibly meaning that the footage might have shown someone police believed to be Gibson driving Andrea's car and entering and exiting her house through the garage. However, this is complete speculation on our part, though. Despite the lack of publicly released information about Gibson relating to the case, investigators would go on to insist on several occasions that he was the main person of interest that they were looking into. Many optimistic reports from that time suggested that police were merely waiting on the DNA evidence they had collected from Andrea's house to be tested so that they could confirm their suspicions. However, months continued to come and go with no information about the evidence against Gibson, and no charges were filed against him in connection with Andrea's murder. In the meantime, the other criminal cases against him proceeded, especially after he was linked to the armed robbery of a subway restaurant at a plaza located at the entrance of the Ivy Falls subdivision. The robbery had taken place just six days before Andrea de Gelder went missing, and during the incident, the restaurant's female manager had been assaulted at gunpoint and bound with duct tape. As you'll recall, duct tape was also used during Andrea's murder. Gibson was ultimately convicted of the subway robbery as well as the firearms violation, and in May of 2019, he was sentenced to life plus 82 years on charges of kidnapping, armed robbery, criminal attempt to commit a felony, aggravated assault, possession of a firearm during the commission of a felony, and possession of a firearm by a convicted felon. While Gibson's lengthy sentence reportedly came as welcome news to Andrea's family, who believed that he was also responsible for her murder, it's here that things get a little bit weird. Essentially, as far as we can tell, this is where all further mention or news of the Andrea de Gelder case completely drops off. As far as explanations go for why this might be the case, perhaps the most obvious one is that basically everyone, especially the police, already assumed that Gibson was guilty of the crime, and with him now in jail for life, there was no need to pursue the case any further. That seems a bit weird to us, though, particularly since if police were so confident about his guilt and the evidence that they had against him, you would think that it would still be worth getting that final bit of closure for Andrea's family. Another possible explanation is that the evidence against Gibson was never as strong as police suggested, and that they knew that they wouldn't be able to convince a jury if the case went to trial. Finally, there's also the possibility the police no longer believe that Gibson was the person responsible for Andrea's murder, but they just haven't come forward publicly with this information. Okay, so the question you're probably asking yourself right about now is, what about the DNA evidence? Didn't police say that they sent a bunch of stuff away for testing? If so, you'd be absolutely right. And this is also the biggest question that we still have at the end of researching all of this. Because as far as we can tell, there's no clear answer. The only thing we know for sure is that the evidence was sent away for analysis. After that, it's unclear if the evidence was ever tested, or if it's simply sitting on a shelf at a lab somewhere in Georgia. In 2019, several news stories did mention the serious backlog in testing at Georgia Bureau of Investigation Crime Labs, but it had already been nearly a year since those samples had been sent back then. Now, it's coming up on four years. And as far as we can tell, those tests still have yet to be done. Frustratingly, this means that at the time of this recording, Andrea's case is still open, and at least officially, remains unsolved. Today, Andrea's memory lives on not only through her family and friends, but through a scholarship set up by her mother and stepfather at the University of Augusta. 
The Memorial Scholarship was set up in 2018 and is meant to help continue the mission that inspired Andrea to research blood disorders and work towards a cure. Now that you've heard the whole story, what do you think? Are there any details or theories that you think we missed? Let us know in the comments section below. And as always, thank you for watching.